Hey guys, so this is the first episode in my new Drawn into Narnia series. I have been wanting to talk about the Narnia books for a long time with people, and I do, of course, my first video on this channel was about Narnia, but I haven't really done a lot of focus directly on Narnia apart from that first video, at least not on this channel. So I am now going to be doing a series where it's one video for each for each book. I probably won't cover everything, I'll just be focusing on a few things that I really love about it. But yeah, and then one more housekeeping thing. I'm going to be releasing these in order of their release date, not in order that they take place. So yeah, just because I personally find them more enjoyable that way. But yeah, anyway, so without further ado, let's talk about Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. So this book, it really, really reads like a first book. Yeah, from everything from the way it introduces the characters to the way the world is introduced, we literally have a POV character where we go into this other world and discover it with her for the first time, and it reads like a, the way a lot of other fantasies set this up, and I don't mean that as a negative thing. C.S. Lewis does it very, very well, and that character is, of course, Lucy, and I think she is the perfect character to be doing this for the audience. She has this incredible sense of wonder, and she's very, very receptive to this world of just like, oh, of course there's a magical world at the, at the back of a wardrobe. That makes sense. <laughs> um, which, of course, in any other world it wouldn't, but in this book it makes sense, and coming from Lucy it makes even more sense, so I love it. Yeah, I also just love the character of Lucy in general. I find her very relatable. I really love how she relates to her siblings, how she relates to the world of Narnia. I love her relationship with Tumnus, who I will probably talk a little bit more about later. But yeah, so that's my little two cents on Lucy. One thing that's brought up actually on the extras of the movie of the Chronicles of Narnia that I find really, really interesting, and I think works really well, is the idea of Narnia as viewed through the lens of an escape from World War II, but also as a way of dealing with the emotions regarding it. I don't think C.S. Lewis was meaning this as like a, oh, they, they actually were in their minds and it was all a dream, this was just their way of coping with it kind of idea, not at all. But I do think that there's some interesting parallels between these children who left England where they were basically being... Well, they were. They were in danger of dying. Their home was being bombed. They were sent out of the city because their home was being bombed on a nightly basis. So, and then when they come to this place of safety, they end up going through through this portal to this other world where there's also a war going on. But this time, they're in positions of power and they actually have to fight back. So there's an interesting dynamic between live between the war on in on Earth in their home and the war in Narnia. Especially given the, kind of the general storyline that goes on in this book. I, one touch I especially love in the movie is in the final battle scene when you see the griffins flying and dropping rocks on the White Witch's army. And definitely a nod to the bombers of World War II. And then of course I can't do a video about the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe without talking about Aslan as a representation of Jesus Christ. It's very, very obvious, pretty much from the first moment you meet him, but it's very much supposed to be obvious, and I really love that. I mentioned in my sister Megan's video over on her channel, where we ranked all the Narnia books, that Aslan is the best representation I've ever seen of Jesus and God in pretty much anything, short of the Bible itself, of course. That's an entirely different scenario. But in terms of fiction, Aslan is the best representation I've seen of God. And is palpable in every scene he's in, in the way he talks, in the way he relates to the characters, in this kind of awe that he inspires in all the characters. One moment that I find really interesting in, in reference to this in the book is when the four children hear his name mentioned for the first time, and all of them have different responses. Edmund, who at the time is in league with the White Witch, I believe the words used in the books are, he gets a sensation of mysterious horror. So he's just, it's a very negative experience for him because he is on the opposite side at this point. Whereas Peter gets this kind of, um, he, he feels basically, he basically gets a shot of adrenaline, of courage. He's suddenly feeling braver, like he can do more than what he could before. And Susan, it, it's as if she, it's as if she smelled something wonderful. And Lucy, Lucy's is my favorite description because it's the, it's the feeling that I can relate to most. And that is waking up in the morning and realizing it's the first day of the, of the holidays. And that is such a Lucy reaction to hearing about Aslan for the first time. I just love it. But of course, the biggest scenes for me in uh, that compare Aslan to Jesus are, of course, the scene on the, on the stone table and the scene immediately after with him. The scene where he's walking to the stone table where, with Susan and Lucy with him is so powerful and intense. He, because he knows what he has to do and he's going to do it. That's never in doubt. 
but he is still feeling that fear and that pain of knowing what he's going to have to go through. And it's so, it speaks so powerfully to the crucifixion and what Jesus actually went through because um, I have, through for various classes I've taken, I have actually had to go through and learn what crucifixion entailed. It was horrific. It was one of the worst ways you could possibly kill somebody. It was basically created specifically to inflict as much pain as you possibly could. If they didn't think you were in enough pain, they would go, they would take extra lengths that I don't really want to describe on here um, to make it more painful. It was so bad that it, as if they were, were crucifying a woman, and this was of course in a time era when women were not seen the same way they are today, but it was so extreme that they would actually turn the woman around and ha so that her face was faced away from anyone so, so passers-by wouldn't have to see a woman in that much pain. And so reading this book and seeing how Aslan responds to going to the stone table is so powerful, especially since, well, the crucifixion itself, or in this case, the death on the stone table, was horrific. I don't, I honestly don't believe that was anything compared to what he had to go through after he died, like while he was dead. And that speaks so powerfully to what he was willing to give up and what he was willing to go through for, in real life, us, and in the book, Edmund specifically, although all of Narnia in general as well. And then in the scene after his resurrection, which in, just in and of itself, the resurrection moment itself is incredible because Susan and Lucy, they are so distraught because one, they just witnessed him die, like, last night, and two, now they think his body's been stolen and they don't know what happened. They just know that suddenly they heard this horrible sound behind them and the stone table's cracked in half and Aslan is gone. And then he's behind them and he's alive and oh my goodness, he's back. And then there's this really wonderful, adorable scene where he basically just chases them around in like a cute little game of tag. And then he just has to roar because he's so, he feels so alive again. And there, and that scene is just so joyful. I love it. And then, of course, the whole rest of the book is he's in his full power and he is here to save Narnia and it's just spectacular and I love it. Continuing on with the idea of the allegories in this book, Edmund is a very interesting allegory for Judas Iscariot because in the Bible, Judas's story ends very differently than Edmund's. In the Bible, Judas Iscariot actually ends up killing himself. He tries to give back the money that he was given to betray Jesus. Um, oh, and actually that's another thing. In the Bible, Judas was paid to betray Jesus, whereas in Narnia, it's a, it's, it's a little bit less purposeful. Um, yeah, it's, it's, Edmund is still at fault, but it's a different scenario. But in Narnia, C.S. Lewis does an interesting thing where he kind of combines the allegorical Judas Iscariot with, I think almost with the allegorical version of, P of the Apostle Peter. I, I mean, I could be absolutely wrong, but this is just how I read it. And, which is funny, given there is an actual character named Peter in this book, and I think he embodies other aspects of the, of the Apostle Peter, but, again, allegorical, so there are going to be differences. <laughs> okay, this is really weird. A lot of this stuff I'm realizing as I'm talking. <laughs> um, but, because Edmund, in the book, he is a representation, simultaneously a representation of Judas, Peter, and humans in general, because... Aslan chooses to go, to, to go and be executed by the White Witch to save Edmund, specifically. I mean, yes, all of Narnia, but it's, it's the witch coming and asking for Edmund that kind of prompts him to make this deal with her. But yeah, I just find it interesting how C.S. Lewis kind of, instead of having a straight-up Judas character, he kind of combined the character of Judas with all these other aspects, and the result is this really powerful character. Edmund is one of my favorite Narnia characters. Um, I find him to be one of the most interesting and complex characters in the Narnia series. As a follow-up to Edmund, there's actually another character as well in this book, though, that also goes through a bit of a character arc in reference to betraying and then turning back to the side of Aslan, if as it were, and that is Tumnus. Tumnus is a... he's interesting, though, because we don't actually really see most of his transformation. We get, like, based on what we see, I personally think he was already well into into changing sides before he ever met Lucy, but his decision to change his mind was finally prompted by just guilt. He felt so horrible that he was going to give this child over to this to the White Witch who was going to kill her. Like, the witch would have killed Lucy if she'd gotten a hold of her. And Tumnus's decision to let her go, it was at huge cost to himself. He was turned, he, like, he, he spent most of this book as a statue because of it.
but it ends up being so wonderful for him in the end. Um, one of my favorite scenes with him, actually in the whole saga, is his reunion with Lucy at the end of this book, where Lucy is in the White Witch's castle and she runs upstairs and finds him, which incidentally in the movie, oh my goodness, such a heartbreaking scene. Um, I'm probably going to do another video about the movie, so I'm going to try and avoid talking too much about them, but yeah, that's kind of, it's a very well done scene. It helps that the, that the actors knew each other quite well in real life and were really good friends. I don't want to talk too much about the White Witch here, just because I'm saving a lot of the discussion about her for the Magician's Nephew video, but I do want to touch on her a little bit. Um, firstly, she is terrifying. She is, for me, probably the scariest villain in this series, with the exception of one, who I will talk about in a later video, but she is, she's so evil, just the way she does everything. She, everything she does is motivated by selfishness or fear. Also fear, that's an interesting thing, is that she is this irredeemable monster, but she is absolutely terrified of Aslan. Even in the scenes where she's kind of putting on a front of courage and power, everyone knows she's scared of him. And it's very interesting to watch, especially given how much power she has over everybody else. Her, the way she acts with Edmund is just so manipulative and creepy, but then as soon as she has him under her thumb, she does not bother acting nice anymore. He is completely under her control. She does not care if he knows he is not safe with her. Actually, she enjoys it. She clearly enjoys making him suffer. But I think the biggest moment of her fear, apart from just her not really being able to be in Aslan's presence for very long, is her reaction to finding out that Father Christmas is in Narnia. Because she finds this group of woodland animals in the forest having a Christmas party. And she flips out. She absolutely freaks. And she tries to kind of pretend to be this benevolent queen, well, benevolent, for about five minutes, not even, probably more like two, during which time she basically says, back down and I'll let you live. And one of them just, I think it's the squirrel, I'm pretty sure it's the squirrel, says, no, he, the Father Christmas has been here, he is here. And she just turns them all to stone because, nope, I can't even have people talk about, have, about Father Christmas being here because it means my power is weakening. And it's, that scene is, it's depressing, but at the same time it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, your time, your time is, is limited. You have so little time left and you know it. And then, of course, she turns and takes her anger out on Edmund by smacking him across the face as hard as she can. Oh, given the fact that she just killed a bunch of people, that is still less bad than it could have been. Now, one theme I'm probably going to end up talking about a lot in this series is the idea of leadership as it's shown in the Chronicles of Narnia, because there's always at least two characters in every book that seem to have something to do with the idea of leadership and how it's done. In this book, you could go with a ton of them, um, but I'm going to be focusing in on the White Witch, Aslan, and Edmund. You, I could also talk about Peter, but I'm going to save talking about Peter's leadership abilities for the next video, because I think it works better there. So first of all, Aslan. Aslan is, of course, a very obvious example of leadership in these books, because he is literally described as the son of the Emperor beyond the sea, the High King above all kings and High Kings of Narnia. He is the ultimate authority in Narnia. He is such an amazing leader, which really shouldn't be that surprising, but it, but he is. Um, but I think actually the biggest example for me of his leadership abilities is his sacrifice, because it shows that he cares more about the people under him than he does about himself, which again is obvious because that's the literal definition of sacrifice, is giving yourself up for someone else. But it's an amazing choice to make as a leader, because it's hard! It's really hard. That's not even counting the fact that he just died. It's an amazing, beautiful thing he does. And I don't know, I'm not really even sure what else to say. It's just watching the way Aslan leads is incredible. And not even just his sacrifice, but the way he mentors Peter, the way he takes him aside and basically says, this is what you're going to have to do. Like, I'm not going to be there with you, but this is, I'm going to make sure you have a backup plan. I'm not going to just hang you out to dry. Like, this is what you need. And then, you know, even though he's not in Narnia most of the time, when he leaves at the end of the book, he ensures that Narnia does have good benevolent leaders to take care of it so that the people, the people will be okay. So that's kind of my idea of Aslan as a leader, particularly in this book. Now, of course, on the opposite end of that, we have his antithesis as a leader, which is the White Witch. And, yeah, it's, it's interesting because she's not necessarily bad at getting things done, but she's not a good leader. She, because she gets, everything she does, she does through intimidation. She, she intimidates and terrifies people into, into doing what she wants. She 
kills people, she turns them to stone, which is in essence killing them, but you know, she tortures people based on what we hear. She threatens people, she manipulates people. Like the scene with Edmund is really weird when she first meets him and it's honestly, ugh, it's just so scary. I don't like it. I mean, I like it as a piece of writing. I just don't like it as a scene because ugh, the White Witch is scary. But yeah, and also it's notable that she's never given a name in this book. That does change later in the series, but here in this book, she does not have a name. She is just the White Witch. She's not a person. She is a creation of just basic, like, yes, I know she is literally a person, but she comes across more as just this being of, malig of malignant hate and control and fear. And she just, the only way she knows how to control people is to force them into it. She can't inspire love. She can't get people to just, to go along with her because all she knows how to do is hate. She controls people. She doesn't know how to get people to, to work as a team with short of scaring them into it. So yeah, even apart from the fact that she's evil, she's not really a very good leader. And then of course the fact that she's evil just quadruples the fact that she shouldn't be in a position of power. Actually quadruple is understating it, but you know. And finally we have Edmund as a leader. Now Edmund is interesting because he is not a leader for most of this book. He is the, in his set of four siblings, he is the third. He's also the second son, which means that not only is he behind in terms of his age range, but the position of power automatically goes to Peter because of the way this, because of the way things are structured in the society. And yeah, it also doesn't help that he spends a good chunk of the, a good chunk of the book teasing his younger sister, which is an abuse of power, which automatically points out that he probably shouldn't be in a position of power right now. So yeah, but then that changes because when he goes through his character arc, you see his priorities shift. When he goes after the white witch, it, she could have killed him very easily. She almost did. And the only reason he survived was because of Aslan and Lucy's cordial. 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 I think that's how it's pronounced. It's been a while since I heard that word. <laughs> um, but again, he has a big sacrificial moment at the end. And it's such a powerful moment because even if we don't see it in the book, it feels powerful because the next time we see him, he's dying. It's, and in, again, in the movie, I know I said I wasn't going to talk much about the movie, but one more thing. That moment is one of the most memorable in the movie because it's such an, uh, an about face turn and you wanted this for Edmund. You wanted him to become a better person. And seeing his reaction, especially since in the movie, he was just told, leave, get out of Narnia. So he made the choice to come back. Also, Peter's reaction is just heartbreaking. And it's oh, just so sad, uh, amazing brother, brother duo. But anyway, so I'll probably touch more on Edmund as a leader in later books because he does start to show more leadership abilities as the books go on. But I just wanted to touch on his origins as a leader here, especially since he's, he started in such an extreme opposite situation. Also, just a little fun fact I wanted to share with you guys. Apparently, Professor Kirk from this book is inspired by J.R.R. Tolkien because, of course, he and C.S. Lewis were really good friends. But, yeah, anyway, if you guys have any comments today regarding this book, feel free to comment down below. I'd be happy to talk to you guys about it. If you have any questions, please let me know. And, yeah, have a lovely day.